Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. So good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I hope that you're enjoying the conference. I've been here uh, since the last day. I made a long journey to come here uh, only for those 45 minutes, but actually uh, we had very good meetings and discussions, and so I'm really happy to be here. It's my first time in India. Um, so first of all, I would like to present myself and to tell you uh, who I am and why I came here and what I'm going to talk with you about and how that um, uh, correlates to what I'm doing on, on the day-to-day -day work. So my name is Ron Riel. I'm located in Israel. I don't know if any of you have been there, but although it's a small country, we're doing quite a lot of uh, software development. It's a different kind of software hub rather than uh, uh, India. But those are two major, um, I think, important uh, places for software development. Uh, I'm with uh, HP Software. I've been in Mercury. Any of you know Mercury? Um, OK. So I've been in Mercury a few uh, years ago, and then we were acquired by HP. And I used to be QA manager for several years, and then I moved to the product management. I'm working very close uh, with the R&D and um, I'm working and defining what they should do to some of our products. Probably some of them you do know, like uh, QTP, Load Runner, uh, Quality Center. And in the last two years, I moved to lead our ALM SaaS offering, which um, maybe some of you know we have a new solution for ALM, uh, for Agile Management, sorry, um, and, and I encourage you to, to watch it. Before I start, so I, de I made the, um, um, I'm not here to talk about, uh, I'm not doing a marketing pitch. Okay, I'm not going to talk about HP products. I'm not going to talk about uh, how you take and implement them in-house. I'm only going to share with you uh, basically what we're doing and what, what practices we adopted uh, internally. The only point that you will see slides of our product, that will be that slide, um, uh, basically, the product, the product line that I'm leading is Agile Manager, uh, our SaaS solution for Agile Management, and a new product that will be available probably by the end of the year, which is uh, bringing a new capabilities for quality um, that are more targeted for, uh, for uh, Agile projects. Uh, stay tuned, it's going to be a fascinating product. Uh, I hope you would find it uh, interesting and relevant for you. If you want to hear more, uh, you are more, more than welcome to come me after that session to hear. So, the main point that I want to reach is that you will get, I don't know, any one of you who is either doing continuous delivery or is planning to move to continuous delivery to, um, uh, to take one or two takeaways from that session um, and tomorrow morning to see, I mean, I guess tomorrow morning is your weekend, right? So uh, two days from now, uh, in Israel we're working from Sunday to Thursday, so in our case it's a bit different, um, but uh, uh, early next week to see what you can take and change and modify the environment that we are working on. Um, we are lucky, I think also <coughs> the guy from Microsoft, uh, uh, they're also lucky uh, because we are developing tools uh, that our customer basically are doing uh, things that are more or less the same as we're doing. So we have the luxury to talk with a lot of customers, to know the market, and to see how we can uh, take all those inputs and um, make sure that what we're doing uh, is really, um, is really um, the right thing to do. You don't need to write anything. Um, I upload everything um, into Google Docs, so you can find it uh, online if you can't scan it. You can come to me later on. I will give you my, my contact uh, information, and you can send me email. <coughs> and you can send me email, and I will send you a link to the, uh, to the case study. Before we start, I want to know more or less who is in here in the audience. So how many people over here are project managers? OK. How many people over here are consultants? OK. How many people over here deals with quality in any way on your daily work? Okay, very good. So before we start to drill down into, into the journey that we had, I want to share with you 
uh, into the details, I want to share with you the journey that we had. And, and more or less like um, uh, the guy that talked before me, um, we released uh, products in a one-year cycle. Uh, we, had, we thought that we were doing Agile. We also called it an Agile. Uh, I can tell you that I've been in conferences uh, a few years ago and I asked people in the audience, how many of you are doing Agile? How many of you are doing Agile? Okay, so that's pretty good. The question five years ago, by the way, was more or less the same. We also raised our hand when people ask us if we were doing Agile. Honestly, we were not doing Agile. We did something in between to Waterfall, to Agile. We had milestones. We used to do stand-up meetings. We call them uh, stand-up meetings. Uh, we also have few events that are, as the people who are doing Agile, but at the end of the day, if you're looking at, at, at the essence of Agile, if we really uh, were able to modify and change stuff that we're working on along the way, we, we weren't uh, capable to do that. Um, when we moved to develop our new product line, uh, we, knew, we knew that we were going to develop that as a SaaS solution. We want to make sure that we are doing things right. Uh, we decided that we want to we move to continuous delivery, um, and that was a big change. I mean, from releasing a product uh, in a one-year release to, um, to release it as an ongoing release, that's a big change. It's a big change not only to the R&D. By the way, the R&D, it's the, the easiest uh, area for you to do that. It's a big challenge for the entire ecosystem. Um, it starts internally in R&D, like QA, uh, documentation, product, marketing, uh, all of those are pretty um, affected by that change. But I will focus only around what we did internally uh, on our teams. Um, we started by targeting to release every week. And, and we didn't, do you know why we changed it? We currently release every, every month to production. Do you know why? So in our case, it's basically our customers ask us that it's too frequent for them. They ask us to reduce the, the amount of changes in order to them to have the time to digest the change. So basically, our pipeline today uh, can provide content to production every month, but we do that on a, uh, every uh, week, sorry, but we do that on a, on a one-month uh, iteration. Our sprints are two weeks long, um, and, and that was part of the change that, that we had. Um, yeah, so I covered... I covered most of the thing. We, we have two weeks uh, sprints. Uh, one month uh, is a delivery to production, and we have a major release, which is every quarter, which is uh, basically all, all the content that we released in the last uh, three, um, three uh, months. So that's basically um, one lesson that we learned about continuous delivery, and I will not going to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to elaborate on that. We are releasing content on um, every month, and it's not changing. What it means that if a feature, if a feature is ready, so it goes on the train. I can tell you now, all of our releases in the next year, except except if they fall on the weekends or, or holiday, we do uh, minor modifications. But basically, we release every month, which means that if a feature is ready, it can go to the release. If it's not ready, Basically, it should wait until the next month. And that's tuned the entire system and, and the developers, the QA, and everyone who are involved in that, product, in that project um, uh, uh, in order to make sure that we are ready. We defined release criteria. Those release criteria are well defined for every feature. And if you don't uh, achieve those release criteria and, the, and the, done, the definition of done, basically this feature is out and it will have to wait for, for another month. And that's basically, it says that, uh, that we failed in our mission to deliver that content. So I want to talk with you what we are doing now. I talked with you what we did, what we are doing now, and I also want to share with you some of the challenges that we are looking um, uh, down the road. So we, as I said, we knew that we are going to move to a continuous delivery. We started to do that. But we knew that we are not doing things right. Um, uh, we felt that uh, we need to do a bigger change rather than just to start to change um, uh, the milestones and the, the events that we are working on. And basically we started um, uh, to understand, and that's what I'm telling you now, it's to understand that that's a cultural change before that's a process change, okay? What it means that all of us need to, had to understand 
that delivering contents in, in such a short time frame really change all the processes and the paradigm of what we did so far. It means that, for example, if we are looking at the QA organization that had the time to um, uh, build and plan their uh, test uh, activities, they had the time to take content. I don't know how many of you that um, have a QA background, how many of you came to the R&D and said, folks, this build is not ready for QA? Are there any people over here like that? So I, I've been a QA manager. That was one of my pleasures to get a new build to run my automation suite and come to say to the R&D folks, unfortunately, my testing suite didn't pass. Please take it back. It's not ready for QA. When you have two weeks, you don't have the luxury to do things like that. And that really changed the way that we had to look on, on, how, is our, on how our QA uh, organization is working and, and to change our own organization uh, structure. Basically, what we did is, is something, I don't know how many people over here are uh, changed their organization to work in, uh, in feature team structure, meaning that all the stakeholders are inside the team. Can you please raise your hands? So at least for us, um, although in many cases people say, well, it doesn't really it's not really important who is the manager, I can tell you that in our case it, it made a big change. Um, once you change the structure of the organiza organization, that the QA is not a separate organization, it's part of the feature team. So the QA task really changed from being the QA problem to our entire team problem. And that's a big change. I can tell you that one of the amazing things that we saw was the uh, reduction of the amount of defects that were reported. I don't know if you've seen, or I'm sure that you can, you can um, um, understand what I'm, I'm talking about. Basically, uh, the number of defects that were reported were reduced. Um, uh, the main reason is that most of the developers, they don't open defect for themselves, right? They just go and fix that. The same thing happened in our case. The, the QA folks, which we'll talk about them um, uh, in a second, they, they worked very close with the, uh, the R&D, and they, when they saw issues, they came, they came and talked with them, and they fixed the issue right away. I'm sure that all of you know uh, the price of uh, solving defect um, 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 in, the, in, the, in the time curve. I mean, if you find defect too, long, too late in, in, in the cycle, it means that it will cost you much more uh, to fix that, right? So in our case, we really pushed that very early in the stages, and most of the issues were detected very early, early in the stage. And as I said, in many cases, we didn't even report a uh, defect. So the quality task started to become uh, not the QA problem, but the entire uh, team problem or our, our entire organization challenge. And that's something that we really saw um, uh, a big change in how it impact uh, the alignment of everyone of, to the QA activities. As part of that, we changed the role of the QA. We don't call them QA anymore. We call them dev testers. In our organization, the teams that I'm working with, we don't have QA. Those are the people, I mean, those are not the exact people that I'm working with, but uh, they are um, uh, dev testers. What does it mean? Did anyone over here, we are not the only one by, we are not the only ones, by the way, that change the term. Uh, did any one of you also saw the term of dev tester? Okay. So basically, um, we wanted to change the name because that was important for us to, um, uh, uh, to show that we really made a change over here and that we changed the definition of the role from a QA guy that that was its only problem to another player in the team who is another developer in the team, but he's more focused on testing activities. Basically, that change um, 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 uh, had several uh, implications. Uh, and, I, and I will talk about, uh, about them right now. The first one is that we, we went to our, to our QA guys and we looked um, on, on the tool set that they're working with. If you come to, if we used to come to our developers uh, before that and we, we, we would come with our tool set that we had, the developers don't like to use those tools. They are working um, uh, with their source controls, with their development environment, their IDEs, uh, they know how to work with, with continuous integration. They know how to use um, uh, open source and frameworks. And those were the ecosystem or the environment they had to use and they wanted to work with. Um, and we knew that we need to change that and to transform what we are doing in order to align that to our processes. So those guys, the new uh, dev testers, had to, uh, to be familiar with those tools. 
In addition, they had to be able to um, have the technical skills to work with those tools. They need to know uh, databases. They, need to know, they had to know how to work or, or write code. They had to know how to integrate into the CI and, and write CI jobs, etc. So that was one of the challenges that we faced, how to look on our QA guys and to see how we shift them, and I will, I, I will talk about it in a second. But basically, on our case, it was pretty easy because as a software organization, most of the people that we had are, uh, are coming from a, a computer science background. Um, but that's a change that I can tell you that we also saw happen in other, company, in other companies that their, their guys over there were with uh, less skills, and they went through an assessment process that I will, I will talk about it in a way. In a way, what we really looked for is people with a background of developers or capabilities to become a developers, but they can look at the application from the quality aspect, which is a bit different. Um, to be able to see the end-to-end -end cases, to understand uh, the end users and, and, uh, um, and our customers, and that was a bit challenging. So we ran through uh, an, assessment, uh, an assessment process when we took all of our QA guys. We ran them uh, through a training of three, three days training where they got all the technical background, uh, they uh, got the skills to work with the tools, and at the end of that process, we really looked toward the people that are capable to become our dev testers. Um, I can tell you that some of the people didn't want to. The less technical uh, guys didn't want to become dev testers, and we looked for another opportunities for them in the organization. Um, but most of them, I don't know uh, if that also happened in your case, uh, also had the inspirations to become developers. So that really uh, brings them more central into the developers' world, and, that was, uh, um, and they were quite excited about that. Um, so after that, we look at the people. At the end of the day, we had around uh, um, uh, 30 to 40 develop, uh, QA guys. We ended with around 25, and we had to recruit a few more when we knew that we, they have to, uh, to come with those technical skills. So I'm I want to talk about uh, the activities that we're doing as part of that, what are the uh, things that we are doing, and the way that we're trying to divide that is things that we are doing during the sprint, or, or as uh, I usually call them, in cycle, and what we are doing out of cycle, and that also activities that, uh, that we're doing. Um, in the past, we used to have those center of excellence. I don't know if you over here how many of you uh, have internally ex center of excellence, automation center of excellence, performance center of excellence, security center of excellence. All of those are, are, are pretty strong, but, um, but we, need, we need to see how we put them early in the process in order to come uh, and to be ready to release in, in such a quick pace. So, manual testing versus automation. Um, so, uh, maybe, maybe you can relate to that. How many, I mean, what's the difference? What do you do, what do you automate? What do you do manual testing? Maybe can someone? I, I can't hear you, sorry. Okay, okay. So I will relate to that. It's pretty correct. Anything else? Okay, that's another point. What you can't automate, uh, do manual. Um, basically, um, we saw many, many customers, and actually we did the same. We, we started with uh, manual activities, and then we took those scripts and we automated them. Um, basically, we knew and we understood that that's wrong, right? Um, um, the challenge is, as you said at the back, that, uh, and, and, and the same here, is that those, you cannot compare them. It's not apple to apple. It's basically apple to oranges. Um, everything that you can repeat over and over again, or you want, or you want to get uh, the main fl flows of your application, your regressions, those are things that we automated. Um, manual activities started to become more the exploratory testing. And all of those um, were fully integrated into our two-week sprints. Developers were um, involved in that and took part in those activities. And, and uh, developers don't like to do QA tasks, right? But uh, when it's the entire team goal, the, everyone are aligned on that. And, and uh, they do exploratory testing. And since that our new automation framework is supporting their environments, 
then they are able to execute those tests, look at the results, and be part of that. And I will relate to that when I will talk about the CI. A um, few more words about automation. So um, unit testing is part of our definition of done. API testing or, or um, uh, uh, lower level testing are also part of what we look in order to make sure that we can run fast and continue and to get those safety nets. The, the, the unit testing is the, the first safety net, the API is the second safety net, and the GUI and the, uh, uh, the front end is the last safety net. Usually takes longer time and then those kind of uh, tests uh, run on a nightly job rather than on our continuous integration job that run uh, faster. That's a slide that I took um, uh, from uh, um, one of our people who is driving the new QA methodology for that team um, that basically describe how they work and implement uh, their, their automation. So they, they first um, start in the, uh, when we do our planning, they start to discover the user story and to look at that and design the test scenario, okay? Usually they're working very close with the developers to understand how they should build that. They code it, and then they map it to a product tree. Uh, I want to talk a few, uh, to, to say a few words about the product tree. Basically the product tree, um, part of the challenge that we had is that user stories last for a sprint. But when we are talking about the quality, we usually want to look for the entire product, right? And, and we don't have the correlation because after the sprint end, you don't look anymore at those user stories. They are not relevant anymore. So what we did, we've built what we call internally a product tree. Basically, this is a map of the product in the eyes of our users. And every test is linked into a place in this product tree. And when we are looking at our quality, we, we look at the map of the product tree. And this is how we know the quality of, of the product. So before they, they uh, move and, and validate that test, they map it into the right place in the product tree. They run a test validation. And once it's ready, they push it into the source control, OK? Basically, they are working in the same practices and methodologies like the, develop, the, like the developers are doing. And then it's integrated into our CI and CD. We, we usually have uh, rules to define to which uh, job that test should uh, be joined to. For example, a GUI test usually will uh, be joined to uh, the nightly build that has a longer time to run. Uh, API test probably will join, depends on the time it takes. Uh, to the CI test, etc. And then we have the report. We see that everything is ready, and it's an ongoing uh, cycle. <clears throat> How many of you? Yes. Sure. No. 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 That's. I didn't mention that at the beginning, but it's. It's. Uh, I'm. I'm from Israel. Uh, we. We are usually interrupt people in, in, in during their speak. So feel free to interrupt. In, in the, anyone who is joking over here probably worked with with Israelis in the past. Yes. So you are totally agree. I will repeat the question if you didn't hear it. So basically he's asking when, um, I mean, automa GUI automation usually can happen pretty late in, in, in the process, right? And, and then how you, you take that into account when you, uh, you build your test automation. So usually since our teams are feature teams, we have people that are front-end development and back-end development. Um, the UI in many cases, by the way, is, ha is ready even uh, before the, um, uh, the back-end is ready. Usually over there, things are more complex, but there are cases that you cannot run the test because it's not linked to the, the backend that really uh, enabled the functionality behind that. Um, I'm not talking about that in this session. I'm, I'm also running the UX. Uh, we have, uh, I have several UXs in my group that working with the team. The way that we are re um, building mockups, et cetera, is a bit different from we, what we used uh, to do. Uh, but you are right. Basically, the things that uh, the cases that we move to uh, automate the GUI is pretty late in, in, in the sprints. Okay, so usually it's pretty either 
we automate the GUI for the previous sprint in case that we didn't reach that or we were able to push that, I don't know, uh, three to four days before the sprint end. So if your tests are data dependent, you can run into the issues where the test may pass into one environment and it fail into the other environment, or do you also have to uh, take the overhead of managing the data or you know uh, uh, freeze the data set? Because a lot of financial applications, what happens is that uh, you're dependent on market data, you're dependent on holdings, et cetera, which changes on a day-to-day -day basis. So did you also come across uh, scenarios like that? Yes, so definitely. Um, basically. Um, uh, data is a um, um, very important piece when you are looking at, at what the validation you, you are doing, okay? So when they develop those tests, sometimes they have different data sets that are for the continuous integration on our daily um, uh, continuous integration that are running and some data sets that are different for our nightly job or for our, the, the job that we are executing during weekends that provision also multiple environments, sometimes more complex environments that we want to simulate uh, uh, more complex uh, cases, okay? All the environments, by the way, this is a SaaS product, but all of them are, are um, um, deployed on the same place that we will later on, I mean, these kind of staging environments, later on those pretty easy can uh, become uh, our production environments. It's the same environment uh, overall. Um, so how many of you over here are doing continuous integration today? Uh, by continuous integration, I mean um, have an ongoing build that are running, deploying, and have testing activities to that. Can you raise your hand? Okay, that's, that's good. I mean, I, I, uh, I presented in a session, I think, two years ago, and, and not many people really did that. I, I was part of the people who were develop uh, QTP, our automation solution, and, and many of them didn't integrate the automation suits into their uh, CI, and they didn't leverage that. Um, so probably this is not new to most of you, but when we have a build that is running, deployed, uh, we are executing the test, we are getting the results. Um, uh, at the end, at that point, if something fails, we are stopping. We want to see what happened. In case that that's a test case that, happened, that, uh, that failed, we are analyzing it if that's a problem in the test or if it's a, a code that change. We know who are the people who push that change into, their, uh, into the CI. And, and they need to either fix it or make sure that the, the owner of the test will fix that uh, the challenge is to see, for example, you talked about uh, GUI testing. In many cases, the tests are ready before the backend is ready, okay? So we have some kind of a way to, to tag those tests that they, are, um, uh, they shouldn't influence on the build status. They are failing. And when we change that tag, uh, in case that the test fail, we know that uh, and it's because of uh, um, the functionality is not ready or it's a, they implemented the functionality, a few adjustments need to, to happen in the test itself. I want to talk, um, I want to talk about uh, security, um, about security and performance. Um, so what we, we started to do, and that's um, a practice that starts to become more and more common. Um, as the guy that talked before me, uh, he mentioned the challenge around uh, performance, okay? Usually the performance issues that are detected late, um, it's, it's, usually you start to test performance because you need the system to be ready to test performance and you do that pretty late in the, in the process and then when you find the issue, usually they are at the back end or, or very core capabilities and a change is very risky and to do those risky changes late in the cycle, it's something that you don't want to do. Um, what we started to do is that our dev testers are running a low level uh, or low scale uh, load testing as part of our CI. So, uh, for example, we are executing uh, 100 virtual users and in a way we have some kind of a benchmark, a benchmark that we can monitor and to see if that's uh, going up or down. And we have a SLA, if this is changing, we are uh, looking into it and to try to understand what happens. Uh, the same goes for security. We do some kind of uh, security checks as part of our CI processes. When we commit a change, there are very basic, uh, uh, very basic validations. But in top of, on top of that, we still have our uh, center of excellence 
that they are involved. They are uh, guiding the, our people what needs to be done. And in many cases, when a deeper uh, or more complex load testing is required or security testing is required, they are doing that and they are checking what is the earliest point that they can do that. So that's a combination of taking the, the need to test those early in the, in the process and leveraging the fact that we still have our center of excellence that are testing that uh, later after out of the cycle, as, as, as I said. Few words about the move to SAS. Any questions so far, or I can move on? Of the sparing up on the project budget and the can, team can size. Can you start the questions? For, sorry, from the beginning because. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, you said a dev tester was paired with a developer, right? Uh, so what is the impact of this on the project budget and the team size? Did it increase the number of people in the team and the how, project How much budget? it increased the number of, uh, I mean, the ratio stayed more or less the same. Uh, it means that uh, our teams are usually uh, around seven people and uh, we have, um, more or less one and a half QA dev testers in that team, uh, product owner in that team, so that's uh, nearly nine to ten people uh, team, okay? That's more or less an, uh, an autonomy that can run by themselves on the functionality that they should deliver. Okay. So is okay. it, uh, what, what is the optimal ratio that you would recommend? So, so it's, it's, I think at least more or less now, since also the, Q, the developers are involved in, the, in the, some of the QA activities, it's nearly one and a half to six. That's more or less uh, the ratio that we have now. Okay. Sure. Sure. And, and what we did so is, is uh, what we did see is, is that our quality uh, uh, raised up, mainly because we detect and find the issues much early, so we can fix them. Our cycles are, are much faster. faster and, and I would also talk about SAS that really can help us to, um, to find the uh, production issues pretty fast and solve them. So um, uh, we can take more risks and reduce some of the overhead that the QA used to have in the past. Sure. So one more uh, related question. So many times, you know, the people in QA offer a different uh, perspective as opposed to a developer. But uh, when, you know, dev testers are closer to developers, like, you know, you call them a dev tester, would you not be missing out on that perspective? Like testers starting to think like developers, so would some, some perspectives not be missing in that case? I'm not sure that I got your question. Um, so um, the essence of the question is testers think differently as opposed to a developer. Yeah, yeah, so I th now, now I got it, yeah. yeah. So basically that was part of the reason that I showed them like uh, superheroes, okay? Because their job is pretty complex. Uh, they need to be able to look at the application as tester used to look in the past, okay? To look at it as an end-to-end, to understand all the functionality, to know how the customers are using the application. They're using some of the capabilities that we are leveraging from the fact that we, we are a SaaS product, okay? But that's, part, that's a very tough, uh, I mean, that's a very tough role. Uh, it's very hard to find very good dev testers uh, uh, overall. I think that the, the ones that can do that, um, I mean, it's very hard to find them and they have a um, job security, I think, for the next couple of years, that's, that's for sure. Um, so a few words about SAS. Um, one thing that we are doing is that we, we are leveraging the fact that, uh, that this is a SAS product and we are doing gradual exposure. Um, basically what it gives us is the ability to uh, take more risks. Um, we, are we, we are using our own product for our project management or agile project management and, and we are the first one that expose new functionality usually on a weekly base. Uh, after that, we leverage or we extend that into the entire HP software after that to HP and only after uh, um, uh, two, two weeks we, all of our customers have uh, experienced that, uh, that functionality. I can tell you that another benefit that we got from that which is not related to QA is that customers that we have that want to have uh, insight to what is coming can take those environments and, and integrate into them and to see what is coming soon uh, to their environments. 
We usually take those two weeks to fix all the problems that, that our customers might, might uh, introduce if we would uh, release that before that. It really gave uh, the QA, uh, or us as the people who are looking at the entire quality piece, um, uh, to be much more peaceful and to be willing or, or um, uh, we, to be okay with the fact that we are taking more risks. Okay? We know that if there are issues, we will see them before our customers will, will experience them. And this is actually part of the reasons that we, we have higher quality. One of the challenges that I had as a QA manager was to know what, are the, uh, what our customers are doing, to understand what are the main flows that we need to test and, and, and to validate them. Uh, we, we do use Google Analytics on our environments and, and we know what are the flows that our customers are doing. Those flows uh, are being used also by us as the people who define the product and know if, if what we, we wanted to push to the product really happened, but also by the QA who know what are the main flow, where we should invest our time and how we should do that. And another place that we are starting to, um, to push stronger lately is, is the ability for a, the, the, the A-B testing capability. Basically, it's not, it's not around testing, it's more around um, uh, validating what the customers need and to see how that works, but it really helped us to, um, to understand the, case, the, the test cases and what need to be validated, what, what really the customers will do at the end. We are doing that on a very uh, small percentage of our customers and it really helped us uh, to know and to get feedback early and to know if things, uh, we need to invest more in testing on that area. So I, as I said, that's a, that's a journey that we went to. Um, um, we still have places that we need to, uh, we need to improve ourselves. I think that there are mainly around the security and performance. We, we started the change uh, uh, nearly a quarter ago and we do see how it impact and, and the value in that and we need to, to do that more. The A-B testing, it's another place that we are um, extending the usage of that, but basically those are the lessons that we learn along that uh, journey. At the end of that, basically what it enables us to deliver new functionality much faster in higher quality. Um, and I mean, I'm not talking about all the benefits of Agile to make sure that what you provide is really what your customer needs, but when I'm talking from the quality perspective, it really helped us to focus and to know what we are delivering and, and to make sure that that's of the right quality. The challenge to do that on a, on a short cycle and, and moving fast, that's a big challenge for, for a QA organization. And as most of people over here said uh, before me, that's really add a lot of fun to the process. People are much more aligned, they understand what we are doing, and they are much more engaged to the process and, the, and, and to uh, the product that we are developing. So just to summarize, we talked about culture change and the organization alignment. We talked about dev tester, the assessment process that we went through in order to make sure or to see that we, who are the people who can be our dev testers. Uh, we talked a little bit about manual testing versus automation, continuous integration, uh, performance and security in the cycle and outside of the cycle, and what are the implications of the SaaS environment. Uh, basically, you can find we have a blog where we, we post uh, not only that story, but also uh, other, other um, lessons that we learned that you can look at. And this is a link to our, uh, our Agile Manager uh, solution that you are more than welcome to take a look at. Um, basically, that was it. Um, I want to thank you. We have a raffle right now of uh, the HP Slate to anyone who feel the information in our booth. So we can do it now, Manish. Uh, do we have that here? Yes? Okay, I'll keep that if you, if you need the links. Um, any questions before we, we do the raffle? So yeah, I didn't talk about metrics over here, but basically we do look at uh, traceability metrics of uh, uh, use cases and features to test. That's part of the definition of done that we, we were talking about and to see that we are covering all of that. We do have metrics that we look also um, on what the developers are really doing, okay? The code changes, um, I, I didn't drill down into that because that's part, part of the capabilities that we have, is to link code change into user story and test and basically to take all the metrics out of that. So you can know I made a change, I know which environments are affected by that 
and to see which tests I, I need to, to execute and to look at, the, at those kind of measurements uh, on the process. I didn't answer you according to your, uh, your face. It looks like I didn't answer you. So if, if, you, if you want, uh, I'm, I'm here so we can talk about that. Okay, thank you very much.